Yorker Films presents Life and Debt A film by Stephanie Black Critics Jury Prize LA Film Festival 2001 Press Contacts Rebecca Conget New Yorker Films 16 West 61st Street New York New York 10023PH2122 for 76110 extension 204 fax 2123077855 info at newyorkafilms.com www.lifeanddebt.org Synopsis Jamaica, land of sea, sand, and sun. And a prime example of the complexities of economic globalization on the world's developing countries. Using conventional and non-conventional documentary techniques, this searing film dissects the mechanism of debt that is destroying local agriculture and industry in third world countries while substituting them with sweatshops and cheap imports. With a voiceover narration written by Jamaica Kincaid, adapted from her non-fiction book A Small Place, Life and Debt is an unapologetic look at the new world order from the point of view of Jamaican workers, farmers, government, and policy officials, who see the reality of globalization from the ground up. The do documentary film includes interviews with former Prime Minister Michael Manley, Deputy Director of the International Monetary Fund Stanley Fisher and short commentary by President of Haiti Jean Bertrand Aristide and former President of Ghana Jerry Rawlings. But the articulate voices of those impacted by the policies of globalization are foremost. Background Information Two international financial institutions wield enormous power over the lives of tens of millions of people around the world. We only recently hear about them in the major news media, and when we do, we are told that they function tirelessly to encourage reforms, so that less developed countries can get their economies in order. From Russia to Thailand to Bolivia to Chile to Haiti, the International Monetary Fund and World Bank offer loans of billions of dollars, provided that the recipient nations adhere to strict structural adjustment programs. These programs include imposing earning limits on foreign investment, devaluation of local currency to increase exports, suppressing wages, cutting social services such as healthcare and education, and keeping the state out of many potentially profitable endeavors. Furthermore, commercial banks take their cue from IMF World Bank approval, governments who won't follow. IMF World Bank prescriptions get cut off from international commercial lending as well no matter how well those governments may be serving their own people. With the collapse of the Eastern Bloc, the free market economy is now seen as the only viable economic system. Yet, within this system, much of the third world is not receiving its share of global resources it contributes a great deal more than it receives. Every morning in Jamaica, thousands of women rise early and travel from their residential communities to the factories lining the wharf in Kingston to sew American goods in the free zone area. Meanwhile, hundreds of other Jamaicans travel to the resort areas lining the north coast. Some go to low-paying jobs in the hotels and shops and others, with no formal jobs at all, see whether they can earn a few dollars showing the tourists the sights or braiding their hair, or hawking crafts on the beach. Farmers without the aid of subsidies try to grow their crops as inexpensively as possible to compete with low export prices from Central and South America. All of these people's lives operate as part of an economic order in which their labor benefits foreign interests more than their own or their countries. This order is enforced by the IMF, the World Bank, USAID, and international trade agreements. Under the guise of providing developmental support to third world countries, these institutions actually operate to control the economies and, in many cases, the political systems of these nations, crippling their efforts towards self reliance. Jamaica like many other developing countries attempted to build its economy, after 400 years of colonization, on policies of self-sufficiency and independence. Due to a variety of external and internal pressures, it was unable to do so without foreign bank loans. Funds obtained through arrangements with the International Monetary Fund required austerity measures that proved to be anathema to progressive reforms. At present, Jamaica, along with many third-world countries, 
has built up an astronomical external debt that must be paid in US dollars. In 1991, 8 billion Jamaican dollars were used to buy the foreign exchange, 640 million US dollars, needed to service the debt. In 1992, as a result of structural adjustment policies mandated by the IMF, the Jamaican dollar was devalued and 18 billion Jamaican dollars were then needed to service the loan. Consequently, all government spending on education, health, social welfare, etc., has been cut by over 50%, great numbers of civil servants have been dismissed, and import regulations have been eliminated. According to the World Bank, of the total money lent to Jamaica, less than 10% actually stays within the country. The rest is returned to the donor countries, to the perpetual detriment of the small nation. While Jamaica is seen to be on the path of success, according to public IMF evaluation, statistics of wealth distribution cite Jamaica as having nearly the worst internal distribution of wealth of any country on the globe, second only to South Africa. As Jamaica has been subject for nearly 25 years to the policies of the IMF, World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank, among other international institutions, the country is a prime example to shed light on how these institutions function to reorganize global production and promote the interests of wealthy Western nations. At present, the IMF and World Bank operate under a veil of secrecy, rendering them inaccessible to intense public scrutiny, they are accountable to no one but themselves. By lending to its audience a greater understanding of these institutions, it is our hope that the documentary will help to make the organizations accountable to the people in whose name they act. The film Utilizing excerpts from the award-winning non-fiction text A Small Place by Jamaica Kincaid, Life and Debt is a woven tapestry of sequences focusing on the stories of individual Jamaicans whose strategies for survival and parameters of day-to-day -day existence are determined by the US and other foreign economic agendas. By combining traditional documentary telling with a stylized narrative framework, the complexity of international lending, structural adjustment policies and free trade will be understood in the context of the day-to-day -day realities of the people whose lives they impact. The Film opens with the arrival of vacationers to the island utilizing Ms. Kincaid's text as voiceover, we begin to understand the profound contrasts behind the breathtaking natural beauty of the island. The poetic urgency of Ms. Kincaid's text lends a first-person understanding of the legacy of the country's colonial past, and to its present-day economic challenges. For example, as we see a montage of the vacationer in her hotel, a voiceover narrates, when you sit down to eat your delicious meal, it's better that you don't know that most of what you are eating came off a ship from Miami. There is a world of something in this, but I can't go into it right now, adapted excerpt from a small place. As we begin to understand the postcolonial landscape outlined in Ms. Kincaid's text, we cut to archival footage of former Prime Minister Michael Manley in a post-independence speech condemning the IMF stating that the Jamaican government will not accept anybody anywhere in the world telling us what to do in our own country. Above all, we're not for sale. Former Prime Minister Michael Manley was elected on a non-IMF platform in 1976. He was forced to sign Jamaica's first loan agreement with the IMF in 1977 due to lack of viable alternatives a global pattern common throughout the Third World. At present Jamaica owes over $4.5 billion to the IMF the World Bank and the Inter-American Development Bank, IADB, among other international lending agencies yet the meaningful development that these loans have promised has yet to manifest. In actuality the amount of foreign exchange that must be generated to meet interest payments and the structural adjustment policies which have been imposed with the loans have had a negative impact on the lives of the vast majority. The country is paying out increasingly more than it receives in total financial resources, and if benchmark conditionalities are not met, the structural adjustment program is made more stringent. With each renegotiation. To improve balance of payments, devaluation, which raises the cost of foreign exchange, high interest rates, which raise the cost of credit, and wage guidelines, which effectively reduce the price of local labor, 
are prescribed. The IMF assumes that the combination of increased interest rates and cutbacks in government spending will shift resources from domestic consumption to private investment. It is further assumed that keeping the price of labor down will be an incentive for increasing employment and production. Increased unemployment, sweeping corruption, higher illiteracy, increased violence, prohibitive food costs, dilapidated hospitals, increased disparity between rich and poor characterize only part of the present-day economic crisis. In one segment addressing the free trade zones, we meet workers who sew five six days a week for American corporations to earn the legal minimum wage of $30 U.S. week, $1,200 to $1,500 Jamaican dollars week. The port of Kingston is lined with high-security factories, made available to foreign garment companies at low rent. These factories are offered with the additional incentive of the foreign companies being allowed to bring in shiploads of material they're tax-free, to have them sewn and assembled and then immediately transported out to foreign markets. Over 10,000 women currently work for foreign companies under substandard work conditions. The Jamaican government, in order to ensure the employment offered, has agreed to the stipulation that no unionization is permitted in the free trade zones. Previously, when the women have spoken out and attempted to organize to improve their wages and working conditions, they have been fired and their names included on a blacklist ensuring that they never work again. Free Trade zones are encouraged by the US government, for example projects financed by the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, have used over $34,960,000 in U.S. tax dollars to target, persuade, and provide incentives to American companies to relocate offshore in Jamaica. Yet as a result of NAFTA, these dismal yet precious jobs are being lost to Mexico, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic. Another segment tells the story of a chicken plant which had a flourishing business selling high-quality chicken to the domestic Jamaican market. Business has recently been undercut by U.S. dumping of low-grade chicken parts in Jamaica. While there are many restrictions on foods and goods imported into the U.S., there are often no restrictions on food and goods exported to foreign developing countries. Agreements such as NAFTA and the Caribbean Basin Initiative function to enforce this inequity under the guise of free trade. Life and Debt includes a segment on the banana industry wherein Jamaica has been granted preferential treatment from the British through the Loam Convention, providing a tax-free import quota for 105,000 tons fruit per year to England. Through a case that the US brought to the WTO, the US government is demanding the Loam Convention quota removed although the U.S. does not grow bananas on its own soil, forcing Jamaica to compete with exporters from Central America and South America. Specifically Chiquita and Dole, which are U.S. companies who produce bananas on a large scale. Central America is characterized by cheaper labor, a different soil type, high rainfall and a climate suited to large-scale banana production and thus more efficient. In 1993, a strike at Chiquita Farms in Colombia with 25,000 workers protesting for better wages was settled by firing shots at the striking workers and killing 40 people, the banana ships. Rolled ensuring Chiquita's high rate of efficiency. Jamaica's entire banana production could be produced by one farm in Central America. Bananas bring in 23 million US to Jamaica, comprising 8% of all exports. Yet, in the Windward Islands, bananas account for 50% of all total exports. In St. Lucia, St. Vincent, bananas also comprise a significant percent of total exports, so quota loss will impact the entire Caribbean. At present the European Union has granted $600 million to help Jamaica become more efficient in their banana production so that they may attempt to compete on the free market in year 2001. The quota that is being so forcefully contested by U.S. multinationals is under 5% of all global banana production. It is unlikely that the banana industry in Jamaica could match the price of bananas from Central America. Already, the number of small banana growers on the island have shrunk from 45,000 to 3,000. 
Every country aims to be self-sufficient in milk production. The milk farmers in the US, Australia, New Zealand, and the European Union all receive huge subsidies to keep their milk prices low. Thus when the milk solids from the US or Europe are exported they are at an artificially low price due to huge subsidies. Jamaica's local production of milk was on a strong upward climb. In a five-year period, 1987 to 1992, the industry grew to 30 million litres, producing over 25% of the nation's consumption, and was poised to rapidly increase production. In 1992, liberalisation policies demanded that the import taxes placed on imported milk solids from Western countries be eliminated and subsidies to the local industry removed. In 1993, one year after liberalisation, millions of dollars of unpasteurised local milk had to be dumped, 700 cows were slaughtered prematurely and several dairy farmers closed down operations. At present, the industry has sized down. Nearly 60% and continues to decline. It is unlikely the dairy industry will ever revitalize. Its growth. Life and Debt aims to clarify the impact that these economic policies have on the day-to-day -day lives of the people they are said to benefit. The voting rights within the IMF are roughly proportionate to the contributions paid in by member nations. The breakdown of the democratic process becomes clear as the Jamaican people are removed from participation in the decisions that truly affect their lives. The IMF promotes an agenda of monetary austerity, currency devaluation, and lowering wages. The goal is to reduce inflation by balancing a nation's loan repayments and imports with its export earnings. The result is usually a recession. The World Bank takes a longer-run perspective. It aims for structural adjustment, which means trying to transform a borrower nation's economy into a free market economy. It typically proposes market deregulation, sometimes accompanied by new lending from the World Bank and private lenders. These policies are supposed to benefit third world economies by integrating them into the global market. What actually happens is that third world people suffer, while commercial banks in the north collect a great deal of interest. In Jamaica, only 5% of total money borrowed since 1977 has been able to stay inside the country. The lessons of Jamaica where these policies have been in effect for nearly 25 years extend far beyond its shores. In nearby Haiti, former President Aristide was pressured to accept loans from the IMF. In Russia, billions in IMF loans have been accepted for the first time and the country is already suffering from the stringent conditions prescribed by the fund. Throughout Africa, countries struggle to meet scheduled adjustments. Life and debt is a tribute to the ingenuity and strength of the people who defy the odds of survival, yet its primary aim is to inform audiences in the US of the impact these policies have on our neighbors abroad. Filmmakers Biographies Stephanie Black, Producer-Director Filmography includes the award-winning feature-length documentary H2 Worker, 16mm 70-minute call, which won both Best Documentary and Best Cinematography at the 1990 Sundance Film Festival. Produced and directed by Stephanie Black, the film was selected to be the U.S. representative in the prestigious Semaine de la Critique, Critics Week, section at Cannes, in addition to winning many festival awards including the John Grierson Award at the American Film and Video Festival in 1991 and Special Gold Jury Award at the Houston Film Festival 1991. The film, which documents the plight of the 10 plus Caribbean men who are brought to Florida each year under a temporary guest worker, H2, visa to harvest sugarcane for American sugar corporations, was also screened in the Library of Congress and the Florida State Senate. The film was broadcast on national PBS as well as on national television in 20 countries abroad. Upon completion of H2 worker Stephanie Black was hired as the chief researcher and second unit director of Incident at Oglala, 35mm 90-minute call an award-winning feature-length documentary on Leonard Peltier and the activities of the FBI on the Pine Ridge Reservation during the 1970s. The film was produced by Robert Redford and directed by Michael Apt. 
For over 10 years, Stephanie Black has been producing and directing live-action documentary segments for children's television workshop for Sesame Street. To date, over 50 short segments have been conceived, produced and directed by Ms. Black for Sesame Street. In addition Ms. Black has produced segments for Nickelodeon's U2U show, CTW's Big Bag Scene on the Cartoon Network and PBS's Zoom. Stephanie Black produced and directed a PSA on the problem of lack of equal economic opportunity in the US entitled More Than Luck for Direct Impact, a non-profit organization in Athens, Georgia. For over 10 years, Stephanie Black has been producing and directing music videos and EPKs for such artists as Ziggy Marley and the Melody Makers, Buju Banton, Snow, Anthony B, INOJ, among others. In 1999, Stephanie Black directed and produced a 30-minute documentary on the making of Chant Down Babylon a Bob Marley tribute album produced by Stephen Marley featuring Lauren Hill, Buster Rhymes, and Erica Baudieu, among others. Other related work experience includes adjunct professor of documentary film at the School of Visual Arts 1991-1994 and presently instructor of documentary workshops at YFVA in NYC.